welcome to Things We Said Today, our bi-weekly podcast about anything and everything to do with the Beatles as a group, as solo artists, past, present, and if we hear about it, the future too. And sometimes we do. I'm Alan Cozen, the author of The Beatles From the Cavern to the Rooftop and Got That Something, How the Beatles I Want to Hold Your Hand Changed Everything, and a writer about music and musicians for The Wall Street Journal, The New York Times, and um, various places, whoever will have me. Joined by my regular co-hosts, Ken Michaels, who you know is the host of the syndicated Beatles radio show, Every Little Thing and a co-host of another podcast, a video podcast, called Talk More Talk, uh, to do mainly with the solo Beatles. Hello, Ken. How's it going? Good. How are you doing, Alan? Pretty good. Hi to all of our listeners. And also by Darren DeVivo, who has been a DJ at WFUV-FM 90.7 in the New York area since... 1984, February 26th, 1984, to be precise. Uh, and if you're not in the vicinity of New York, you can hear him and everything else at WFUV.org. Darren, how's it going this week? It's going pretty well. Hello, everyone. Hey, Ken. Hey, Alan. And uh, two more weeks have gone by, and it's time for another show. And no new injuries. No new injuries, <laughs> no, but... Uh, no, no, no injuries. Actually. Okay, well, congratulations. <laughs> uh, and this week we have um, two special guests, Robert R. Hieronymus, uh, also known as Dr. Bob, and Laura E. Cortner. They are the co-authors of It's All in the Mind, a new book about the Beatles' Yellow Submarine film. Uh, this is actually volume two. The first one, Inside the Yellow Submarine, came out in 2002. And um, I had thought that that was pretty much everything you needed to know about Yellow Submarine, but here is a whole new volume of interesting material. We'll be talking to them about it. And um, you might as well welcome to the show. Hello, Bob and Laura. Well, hello, hello. Good afternoon. Is it still afternoon over there? Or is it almost evening? It's afternoon somewhere. And it's hello, afternoon hello, hello, hello. I guess we have to say it three times. Yeah, it's You're everything probably everywhere. in the same time zone as us, I think, although we're all spread out various places. You're still in Baltimore? Yes, indeed, we are. Okay. Yeah, we're all, we're all East Coast. East Coasters. Right? We've got Baltimore, and we've got Maine, and we have Connecticut, and just outside of New York City. Yeah, we could go all up and down 95. <laughs> yeah. And we, we thought we were done, too, Alan, when we finished that 426-page volume one, put it down, and wrote a couple more books, and... Bob painted a couple more murals and art cars, but yeah, here we are. Just like with anything Beatles, you keep digging and you keep finding more stuff. There's always so more. Did yeah. the volume two. Okay, and so first we'll have um, our news segment, um, for which I will turn everyone over to Ken. Ken? All right, thank you, Alan. I am so looking forward to hearing from Dr. Bob and Laura. This is going to be interesting. In Beatle news, Ringo Starr's new EP, Zoom In, gets released this Friday with five new songs from Ringo. The title track, Zoom In, Zoom Out, has already been made available on YouTube. And it was written by Jeff Silbar and Joe Turley. Jeff is best known for having co-written Wind Beneath My Wings. And uh, you can bet that in our next show, right here on Things We Said Today, we'll be reviewing it, the EP. At the Grammy Award ceremony, Ringo Starr appeared at the very end of the night to present the Record of the Year Award to Billie Eilish for her song, Everything I Wanted. Ringo thanked everyone who made music in the past year, considering what the world has been going through. Paul McCartney's Flaming Pie was nominated for Best Boxed or Special Limited Edition Package, but was to Ode to Joy. Lawrence Azarod and Jeff Tweedy from Wilco uh, listed as art directors. However, the Toots and the Maytals album Got to Be Tough, which was co-produced by Zach Starkey, won the award for Best Reggae Album. Frederick Toots Hilbert from the band died last year. Best Traditional Pop Vocal Album went to a member of the Apple family, James Taylor, for his album American Standard. And Vivek Tiwari, who we know for writing the book The Fifth Beatle on the life of Brian Epstein, which last we heard was in talks for a limited series for television, has been one of the producers for the musical 
Jagged Little Pill, based on Alanis Morissette's music. Vivek won a Grammy for Best Musical Theater Album. Good for him. And in their In Memoriam segment, it was nice to see Emmett Rhodes mentioned, as was Jerry Marsden towards the end. And Bruno Mars did a nice little tribute to Little Richard. And you saw this yourself, Darren. A nice yep. surprise there. Rita Houston yep. getting honored. Yep. The late program director yep. for WFUV. That was a big surprise to me. And I guess uh, to most it, people. It was a surprise to me. I, I'm assuming, I don't think anybody on the staff of WFUV knew that that was coming. Maybe there was one or two people, perhaps. Um, I mean, again, we're all remote now. We haven't actually seen each other in person in a year because we're all still, you know, doing, we're still all doing our thing remotely. But that was a very pleasant surprise and a very sweet moment. And the timing was was uh, fascinating uh, and was probably not a coincidence because uh, Rita Houston, again, as you mentioned, the program director at WFUV, and she died in December. Rita was a uh, very close friend of both Brandy Carlisle, who had performed, and Brittany Howard, who was performing with Chris Martin of Coldplay at the time of that uh, Rita's image appeared in the uh, in that segment of the Grammy. So it was it was a very nice tribute and uh, very touching. So if you go back and <laughs> watch that segment, or if you saw it, uh, Rita Houston worked with me at WFUV. I think starting in 1994. Fourth, 93, 93 and 94. And again, she passed away in December. Okay. Very nice. You know, very nice to acknowledge someone who played such a big part in radio and in the New York area. Um, as we are recording this show on March the 15th, Ringo is scheduled to appear on Stephen Colbert's show tonight. No doubt to discuss Zoom In. So we'll talk about that in our next show. Ringo was interviewed for 30 minutes by Eric Burton of the Black Pumas, who appears on the new EP. And Ringo talked about the song first released, Here's to the Nights, written by Diane Warren, who wanted the song to be sung by a crowd on New Year's Eve. Ringo said, great, I'll get my crowd of people and you get yours, which is how they got a crowd to sing the chorus. Ringo also said what made this EP different in the recording process was that because of the pandemic, he asked his friends to give him songs and produce it. And he, Ringo, would add his vocals and drums. He actually made a reference when talking about decisions he had to make in life about a girlfriend he once had who was moaning about Ringo wanting to play drums for a living. This could be the girl that he was engaged to before Maureen that he never talks about. Interesting quote from Ringo. He says, vocals is something I do. Drumming is something I live even going on to say that the Beatles ruined him as a singer because he thought of himself as a rock singer, and here he was singing songs like Yellow Submarine and Good Night. <laughs> he also <laughs> said he wanted to be a barroom singer. This is stuff I never heard before from, from Ringo. And he said, um, he's talking about Back Off Boogaloo, how George wanted him to play a different drum pattern at the beginning that Ringo couldn't do, so he came up with the intro that's on the snare drum. So he got a great-sounding intro on the song because what George suggested was something that he wasn't capable of doing. <laughs> Very interesting. Since our last show, all the details have become known concerning the forthcoming box set for the Plastic Ono Band. The website johnlennon.com has lots of information about it. The Super Deluxe box set will contain six CDs with 102 new stereo mixes, over six hours of audio. We'll also have two Blu-ray audio discs with 159 new stereo mixes, over 11 hours of audio in high resolution, 192 to 24 stereo in 5.1 surround sound and Dolby Atmos mixes. It also comes with a 132-page hardback book with rare photos, memorabilia, and extensive notes, plus a war is over poster and two postcards. All the music is completely remixed from the original tracks. It also includes ultimate mixes, outtakes, elements, raw studio and evolution mixes, demos, jams, and live sessions from Yoko's Plastic on All Band album. And that is strictly, the Yoko part, strictly on the Blu-ray audio. Yoko's recordings there from the sessions runs 110 minutes. The full list price for the box set is $135.84. It will also be made available as a two-CD set 
a single CD, a double LP, and for download and streaming. The big release date for that is April 16th. Speaking of April 16th, that very same day, we'll see the release of an album of cover versions of songs from the McCartney 3 album called Three Imagined. All of the album's 11 tracks have either been remixed or covered by many of today's newer or independent artists, and all the tracks have been personally curated by Paul. It will first come out as a digital release only on April 16th and is now available for pre-order, followed by a physical format coming July 23rd, including exclusive vinyl editions available through independent record shops, Target, Barnes & Noble, Newberry Comics as well, and Paul's own site. The physical editions will get a bonus track with Idris Elba's version of Long-Tailed Winter Bird. All vinyl editions are supposed to be very limited, even the black version. And already a video has been released of The Kiss of Venus by rapper and songwriter Dominic Fike with uh, a cameo appearance at the end from Paul himself. Reading the New York Times. That's right. He's probably looking for an article from you (laughs) in there. Could be. Other artists on the compilation include Damon Albarn, Beck, Blood Orange, Phoebe Bridgers, St. Vincent, and more. This release will also be coming out on CD. An update on the forthcoming album of cover versions of Beatle and Solo songs from Marilyn McCoo and Billy Davis Jr. called Blackbird, Lennon McCartney Icons. At first, I had only seen it listed as a digital release on Amazon. Uh, it will also be coming out on CD. You can now pre-order it on Amazon. I originally heard its release date was April 30th. Amazon now says it was first available on February 26th. All right, and finally, we have a few passings to mention. Uh, first of all, there's Chris Barber, the British trad jazz band leader at the age of 90. Chris was a trombonist, a double bassist, and band leader, and he influenced the path of mid-century pop. Barber's biggest hit in both the UK and the US was the instrumental Petite Fleur, which went top 10 in both countries. That was in 1959. Barber also collaborated with Lonnie Donegan and played double bass on his classic 1956 hit, Rock Island Line. But his biggest connection to the Beatles came from the song that Paul McCartney wrote, an instrumental originally titled Cat's Walk, which was retitled Cat Call. And Barber and his band recorded the song at Chapel Studios in London on July 20th, 1967. And Paul was there for the session, acting as a cat caller and doing a woo-hoo on the record (laughs) a little more than two minutes in. The recording was later released on a compilation, the songs Lennon McCartney gave away. That was in 1979. There is a bootleg recording of the Beatles doing the song as Cats Walk from their Cavern Club rehearsals. And you can hear both the Beatles recording of Cat's Walk and Chris Barber's Cat Call on YouTube. Also, there's Baskar Menon, the legendary head of EMI and Capitol Records, who has died at the age of 86. He oversaw the releases of many Beatle and solo Beatle albums and was responsible for the success of Pink Floyd's Dark Side of the Moon, which launched the group to superstar status. There was a story in The Hollywood Reporter that Baskar flew to India to bring George Harrison a two-track recording machine so he could record his uh, Wonderwall music album there, as the studios in Bombay only had a mono machine. And finally, there's the passing of Zach Nilsson. Zach was the first child of Harry Nilsson, and he died on March the 4th from colon cancer. Zach was only too proud to be Harry Nilsson's son. He was actually a pretty good singer and drummer though he never pursued a music career professionally. When I interviewed him a few years ago, he told me the story of how he met George Harrison and his son Danny when Harry went to London to record the song How About You for the movie The Fisher King. And during his stay, they went to George's home in Henley. Zach was amazed at George's guitar collection and spent some time privately talking with Danny. And Zach had just turned 50 years old. And uh, if you are interested, my interview with Zach is on my website on interviews page four. um, And that's at KenMichaelsRadio.com. Very sad to hear about Zach, a really sweet guy. And uh, I really feel privileged to have interviewed him. This was back in 2018. And that's it for the news. 
All right. Okay, cool. Okay, so on to our main subject for the day, which is Yellow Submarine. We had Paul Rutan on uh, maybe oh. last year or the year before, one of these shows, who was pretty interesting about it, and um, he features in your book as well. Uh, the other thing that I, I left out introducing you, Bob and Laura, was that you are also, uh, well, Bob has a show called 21st Century Radio, and that's out of Baltimore, mm -hmm. and uh, I just thought I should mention it. So, in fact, you've been a guest on our show. If, if I'm, I have been. Alan, yes. I think I'm speaking now. Yes, and and it's always it's always quite a trip. So we it, thought we would <laughs> we thought we would see time. if we could have a trip for you too. Yeah. <laughs> um, There's nothing like saving a good trip. <laughs> what station is it on? Just in case our listeners want to know and they want to stream it. We air on WCBM in Baltimore, also online internet podcasting and all that, but mostly analog radio here in the Baltimore Washington corridor. It's WCBM 680. Okay. Wow. What time is it on? It's way? Sunday nights, 8 to 10, and people could find out more about it at 21stCenturyRadio.com. Okay, very good. Okay, so what we do is we'll. Uh, each sort of ask you a few questions and go around uh, in a theoretical circle covering the area of many states and uh, and then make our way around again. I guess I, uh, one way to start would be just to say, okay, why volume two and how did, how did all the extra information manage to coalesce into a, a full book length volume? Yeah. Well, I think we obviously we thought we were done, too. As a matter of fact, I had a number of other projects that I never got back to because doing this particular book took an enormous amount of time because of all the things we had to rediscover. And boy, did we rediscover stuff. We dedicated it to uh, Bob and Seema Balser mm -hmm. and Hines and Anna Edelman and Sir George and Lady Judy Martin, mainly because we worked with them for years. And it was extraordinary, especially working with uh, Sir George. He is, an, he is a fellow that I think, well, he'll, he'll never be fully appreciated. Let me put it that way. Hmm. Because of his kindness, the way he, is, he handles people, especially children, uh, and his understanding of other things such as people who won't necessarily tell you the truth. And up front, he knows he can go right zero right into it. He's a very advanced soul. And especially we enjoyed talking to him about things such as UFOs and the paranormal, which he was dying to talk to other people about. But unfortunately, it seems like nobody seemed to want to talk to him about those kind of things. But mm -hmm. he's really deeply involved in those. What would you like to say? Well, I'll, I'll tell you that that's the subject material mostly for our 21st century radio program. That's how that got segued in there. But I'll tell you about volume two. When we published volume one, we didn't know it was a volume one, but the first book that came out in 2002, we almost immediately started hearing from animators around the world who were upset that we hadn't included them in volume one. And at first we thought people were repeating themselves and we couldn't possibly hear anything new. But lo and behold, we started to hear some new stories. So we decided to start collecting them along the way. It took us, what, 19 years before we published volume two. So we did it very slowly. But it's mostly motivated by Bob's sense of injustice. Whenever he finds an injustice in the world, he tries very hard to correct it. And in this case, it's done towards the artists who are mostly unknown, who worked very hard to create this film that we all love so much. But they're all behind the scenes, and many of them didn't even get a screen credit, much less any recognition. And I don't know about you fellas, but when Bob first saw the movie, he was a grown-up, and he assumed, like many people did, that the Beatles made the film or at least directed it and made, you know, all the creative decisions because there wasn't a whole lot written about it at the time. So that assumption was easy to make and the press wasn't exactly clear. And uh, so they just didn't get the notice that we thought that they deserved. So when we started hearing from these younger animators and realizing that some of them did have some stories we hadn't heard before, including the, the hijinks, chapter five, that whole chapter of what they, they got up to is the special practical jokes they paid on each other and these kind of things about what they wore and what they ate. This was decidedly a younger set of people than the first round that we interviewed in, in the first book. The first book 
focuses mostly on the the core creative team, the people who were directing it, and George Martin, of course, directing the music, uh, incidental pieces, uh, the people that created the innovative designs, like Charlie Jenkins and, of course, Heinz Edelman, who designed all the characters. There are about, I don't know, 20, 30 of those people who made all the main decisions. But this book is focused mostly on the, the grunt workers, you know, the the actual key animators who designed what the storyboards were were being dashed out. You know, there, as you know, there wasn't a script that was decided on until the very end. So it was very, very challenging for these animators to and know I gotta what say, to do. If you don't mind. All right. I, I got to say that the, uh, if it weren't for Laura and her depth of being able to go to extreme, well, she's, she was kind of mirroring what I do. I, I am extremist when it gets to getting every piece of information out about something as possible. And of course, can offend a lot of people. So fortunately, the way she did it, she was able to pull information out of them that normally they wouldn't necessarily talk about. And that was very difficult to do because I felt terrible for the artist that created it. As Dr. Cortner mentioned over here, that the, uh, when we first saw it, we realized that some, th- some people weren't getting any credit for anything. And uh, that's not unusual on these kind of things and kind of work they were doing. But we wanted to make sure that everyone got their chance. And that's why Sir George said the most important thing about your book, Bob, is that you have actually told people who created the film and how it was done. And that was a very difficult thing to do. And that's the that's the rational explanation for why. But on another level, it's a feel good movie. And that's what we need right now. It's a yeah. feel good book about a feel good movie. And I think the more <laughs> joy that we can spread, you know, the more we can inspire people to go watch the movie again yeah. and just dance and feel good about love overcoming evil in a way that doesn't have to kill it. It just transforms it and turns them into friends. I think the ultimate message of the film is one that everybody should be reminded of as often as possible. So mm-hmm. that, that's the other reason. It's mm-hmm. something that we'd like to, to keep alive is the Yellow Submarine. Okay. Um, what what struck me as kind of interesting about the book, um, volume two probably more than volume one, although I guess there's elements of that in volume one too, is that you've got like several books going at once, it seems sometimes, like parts of it in the early chapters and then later again when I was reading about the creators of the film and it kind of had the texture of a novel almost. I mean, you're finding out where these people went to lunch, what they drank, what, where, you know, the whole, um, and in the process, you're describing the whole area around the studio and where they go and uh, who's falling in love with who, who's getting married, you know, among the, the creators of the film. And yet at the same time, there's also this whole analytical aspect, um, which, you know, looks at, I mean, you, you, you point out that the creators of the film weren't necess- weren't thinking of any of, of the underlying analytical things that you're mm-hmm. talking about, but you make a pretty interesting case for a lot of the symbolism in the film and, uh, you know, just sort of various archetypes. I mean, it's it's funny, I was reading some of it and, and thinking, you know, some of this is a bit like Joseph Campbell. And then three paragraphs later, there's Joseph Campbell. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> so um, I, that, as writers, that must have been an interesting thing to try to balance, you know, how you go from one thing to the other. Is it, where, was it as difficult as, it, as, as I'm guessing or, or did it just fall together? That just fell together, really. But I'm glad you brought that up because that's another element of volume two that did not make volume one. And it was a chapter that Bob wrote for volume one. But Krause Publications, as you probably know, is a, a record what, a record collector yeah. publishing kind of company. So they published Goldmine, right? The, they, were, they were worried, yeah, they were worried that the average reader would not get it or would not appreciate this more symbolic interpretation of, um, which is Bob's specialty. As, as, you, as you may know, his PhD is in the interpretation of the United States Great Seal. So he's got a whole doctoral dissertation on that one symbol of the eye and the triangle over the pyramid. So when he sees a movie so full of symbolic entries as the Yellow Submarine is, he's going to immediately assume that there's meaning and message and a, a cosmic message of, uh, of life and what you can learn from it. And 
uh, I'm glad that you thought it was um, a good argument because um, a lot of people would object to that, that we read too much into it. But as we started to realize a lot of other people have done just as probably even deeper interpretations of this film than Bob has and using quantum physics and things I wouldn't know about to even consider. You're, and, you're right. That and we was included extraordinary. Some of that. Yeah. It really was. But Bob has his own special breakdown of what yellow <laughs> means, what submarine means, what beetles means, you know, beetles being compared to the ancient Egyptian god, the beetle-headed god, Kera, and it's a it's a symbol of rebirth and renewal, which the beetles with an A certainly were very masters of rebirth and renewal. They went through so many different personas through their short career. But this beetle-headed god rides a sunboat through the sky. So a yellow boat through the sky sounds very much like a yellow submarine too. You know, none of this was done on purpose. Well, we don't know. We don't know really, because it's possible. There are Lenin, John Lennon is well read in the areas of Egyptology and other areas like that. As a matter of fact, the Beatles, Paul McCartney especially too, they had very close friends who owned bookstores and they, and they were very esoteric bookstores. And so they were always given information in that, that particular area. So we really don't know if they could have, I think if there was anyone in the group, it would have been probably John. So in that sense, you'd be talking about really just the, the basic song from which the film emerged. Made since the connection. They, since they did. Get on Buddy Holly's so. crickets and one <laughs> 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 but maybe my thought, after a while, after after a while looking back, what did this mean? Why did I pick it? Maybe they did. Maybe you're right. But the same thing, like like Alan was saying, the same thing with the people who made the film. There's a pyramid. The, the yellow submarine launches from a pyramid. Um, does it mean what we think it means? I don't think so. <laughs> it's a bandstand. It's a pyramid. As as the animators will tell you, they were working so fast. They just threw in whatever they could think of. I don't think they thought it through. Like, hmm, this kind of looks like the U.S. Great Seal with a radiant eye above it. Mm -hmm. um, but Bob saw it that way, and so he goes ahead and interprets it that way. And and the Beatles were happy to do that too, at least in their in their later years. Uh, we quoted from the the Playboy interview where both John and Yoko were saying stuff like, you know, that maybe they were channeling, that maybe they didn't know, you know, they 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 flipped back and forth as you all know better than we do on whether or not there was a higher, deeper meaning in their lyrics, or was it all just thrown together, as, as they sometimes would say. So, yeah, I think that we, as interpreters, as viewers of art and listeners to music, um, I think we have the right to interpret our own way, as, as long as we do it respectfully and, and based on fact and don't go off in a tangent or a rabbit hole like some of those theories can. I won't... Mm. So you is your argument that if, if the animators and... Uh, people preparing the film didn't really think of these things that these interpretations are valid because of, you know, the collective unconscious and just things that are, that are just part of our way of thinking and, and, and historically looking at things that those things will inevitably come out in a, in a creative project like this. That's correct. Yes, I believe so. You know, when you just take a look at the title, the yellow submarine, what do you got there? Yellow is a symbol for intelligence. It's also a symbol for divine wisdom. So it is divine wisdom to take a look on the inside, steer clear of illusion, living in the mind rather in the emotions. It's all about pulling it up out of the emotions and into the mental aspect of it. And I think that's, that's one of the things I enjoyed so much about it because I believe that the Beatles did understand what that meant, higher consciousness for sure. That's uh, new things are being discovered about the Beatles songs that I'm just finding out about. Not, we're not going to write another book <laughs> on this, <laughs> but we're pushing uh, an individual who has got some theories on the multiple meanings of everything in, that the Beatles do. As a matter of fact, what is his name? I think you're talking about Jake Pollard, but that's that's true about any symbol. You you say that in all your works that you can interpret things along many different levels. So yes, whether or not the artists did it in on purpose or not, those symbols, as you say, were are part of our collective unconscious. They show up again and again in all kinds of art, and they have different levels of meaning. So they can mean one thing to one person and 
have a completely valid interpretation that's different from another person. Okay, I think I should turn you over to Ken now. Okay, thanks, Alan. And uh, I have a, a mixture of questions here. Some of them are just very general questions that I think the average Beatle fan wants to know, and some of them are directly based on what's in your book. I must have a full confession here. I never read volume one. I'm sorry. I hope you'll forgive me. <laughs> is it still available? Can you get it? It is. Oh, it is yeah. still available from us. I think I've seen it on Amazon as well, but there's a third copy, so some of them are pretty pricey. Hmm. But, uh, we have it for sale on the same website, yellowsubmarinebook.com. Ken, let me jump in here one second, because uh, I, I want to ask about this being the second volume. If somebody picks up the second volume and reads it first, are they getting the the true meaning of what your goal was with uh, this p whole project, or should they go seek out volume one first and read that first and then the new book? Well, I'm biased. I would say that they wouldn't necessarily need to read the first book unless they wanted to know A, B, C, D mm -hmm. about the aspects of it. This is a more about a philosophical look at it. And so I would think that it's, in my opinion, it's a much more enjoyable book than the first book. There aren't too many colored pictures, and colored pictures mean a lot to me when we're talking about this kind of topic, and there weren't that many. Our publisher did not give us that many. That's one of the reasons why we decided we were going to take over and do this ourselves. We have, my gosh, I don't know how many hundreds of photographs, and colored photographs there are mm -hmm. in it. This, this is a far superior book. Even from the standpoint, this may not be important to other people, but the quality of the paper and the quality of the inks, et cetera, et cetera, it's just a much better production, and we really wish we could, in a certain sense, redo the first book to give it the right kind of paper and the right kind of colors, etc. Because we had, we're talking about all the important people, all the way from, from not just the guys that created it, but people like Peter Max, who, who is one big problem. <laughs> yes. Well, I'd, I'd like to ask um, Ken that question, but I, I believe it stands alone. I think it's a standalone book. And uh, volume one, okay. as, as Bob says, is more of if you really want to know everything that went into the making of the film, you want to go back and read volume one, too. Okay. What, okay. what do you think, Ken? Does it stand alone? I think so. See? I got a lot of information out of this. But there's always questions I'm going to have even after reading this that I won't know for sure. That That's why you're here, though. <laughs> that's our job yeah so i just want to thank you first of all for making me aware and beetle fans aware since i didn't know this that the phrase it's all in the mind really came from the goons mm -hmm. from their radio show yeah yeah was this a phrase that was commonly said on the show or, or yes. how did you find out about it by listening to all the goons i have just about every one of their shows <laughs> It, because I knew they influenced the Beatles a great deal, and obviously I'd like to know who influenced the Beatles and why. And it was the kind of sense and the sense of humor that they have, which yeah. is similar to the, the Beatles' sense of humor. They would say it frequently when they were doing some kind of skit, you know, and on radio, of course, that was the heyday of radio, hmm. uh, you know, with all the sound effects and whatnot. It was sort of like the closing phrase. They'd say, ha-ha, it's all in the mind, you know. So, yeah, it comes up quite frequently. And I don't know... I don't remember now. Did we hear some Beatles say that they heard that? I know that they listened to the goons a lot. We've, we've seen well, that. Well, certainly they heard it from them. Yeah. Yes. Well, they must have enjoyed hearing it in the movie. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's something else. So let me just start by asking, when was it official that Yellow Submarine was going to be made? When exactly was there uh, like a contract signed? And how much time did the team and the staff have to make it? Okay, I can answer part B, but you guys are the Beatles experts. Come on, don't, don't give us dates <laughs> on Beatles. You're, You're the yellow Beatles. submarine expert. <laughs> <laughs> that's volume oh. one. <laughs> yes, that's volume one, That's 400 pages on that. Um, so, yeah, how long they were given. I can, I can flesh in most of that answer. So, as you know, Al Brodax, who got the contract from Brian Epstein to do the Beatles cartoon series on ABC as one of many merchandising productions that came and went during those early days of Beatlemania. And um, we all hear how the Beatles hated the cartoon series, and it's the bloody Flintstones on LSD and that kind of criticism. 
But I've read, I think it was Tony Barrow who, who made it very clear to us that um, they really didn't mind them. They, they complained about the voices. One of them was an American voice actor and the other was a, a, another English person. But still, the voices were very odd for, for the Beatles. They didn't sound like Liverpudlians at all. That was their main complaint. Of course, the animation was cheap and, and quick, but that's TV for you. So when Brodax got that contract made, he built into the contract if the television series was successful, he would have the rights to make a feature-length film. So when he heard that they were going through the trouble of that third film contract that they had with United Artists, he went again to Brian Epstein and says, hey, you know, you promised me a, a feature film. Here's the solution to your problem. The Beatles don't want to get together to make a movie. We'll just make an animated movie. And so they went with it, but um, there was some argument as to whether or not it would be something the Beatles would support. They didn't have too much faith in Brodax to produce something lasting. A feature film is much more lasting than a, a TV program. And so there was also, I think with anything you do with a, a pop group who's popular at the time, there was that built-in fear that they may not still be popular. It's hard to think that they would say that about the Beatles in hindsight, but I, I can understand why they would think that. So when they first inked the deal, it was somewhere in the summer of or the spring of 1967, I think it was around May, if, if I'm not mistaken, when they signed the contract right. and got started. They picked the date for the premiere of July 17th, 1968. So once they got started, they had 11 months. And they, they decided if they waited any longer, then the Beatles may no longer be popular. Who knows what their motivation was <laughs> to give them just 11 months when it would have taken Disney, the only other people doing animated features at the time, Four, four years. Yeah, it would have taken them years. four years to do an animated feature-length film. And these people had to do it in less than a year. And they had less than 11 months when you think about it because Al Brodax kept putting out these scripts that were just like the TV cartoon. It was very simple, slapstick humor, just chained together by songs. He thought, another reason he thought they could do it quickly, is that they could churn out something simple like that. But it was the same crew, TVC Cartoons of London, who was making their money off of doing animated commercials for the most part that got the the TV series and they were given the film and uh, director George Dunning is the one who has the who gets the credit for putting his heels down and saying no we're not going to be known forever as doing a feature length film that looks like this we're going to do something special so they they started this international casting call for an avant-garde designer they eventually landed on Heinz Edelman and then they had all these problems with the script because um, Brodax kept supplying these candy floss scripts, as somebody called them. And they had to cobble it together based on many, many, many different um, contributions. But in animation, you have to have the dialogue track first before you can draw any pictures so that months went by with, right. with all these animators hired and ready to paint with nothing to do. So they started animating the song sequences and hoping they could figure out some script storyline plot to chain them to. Um, Nowhere Man was one of the first ones done. Eleanor Rigby was one of the first ones done. And um, so they just started doing the songs. The, the, the travel sequences were able to be done without very much plot involved. They knew they were going to have an, an, a crusty old salt, the old Fred character. He made it from the, the beginning script. And they had a Nowhere Man character. But it started out as a seal, as I recall, from the <laughs> first script. That's right. It was a yeah. pink seal that followed him around. Some of those wow. scripts are really strange. And they had mermaids in them. Yeah. I mean, it was, it was something that Heinz was not going to do. As yeah, a matter mermaids. of fact, when he was told that he had to put mermaids in it, he stopped work and he said, I'm going to just create animals monsters. and monsters. Mm -hmm. And you're going to have to take them. And that's how he did it. Heinz was an extraordinary soul. Um, he was so advanced in many so different ways, but at the same time, he had never been involved in anything like uh, a film, especially this kind of a film. Hmm. So he he must have quit 20 times or more. And we thought that was an exaggeration when yeah. he told us that when we interviewed him for volume one. But in this book, we talked to Norm Drew, one of the animators who was hired and uh, at the towards the middle of the production. He wasn't hired at the beginning. He started in January of 68. And he was squeezed into Al Brodax's production office. He was right there with the producers of the film. They had run out of room for where to put him. So he and, and his animating partner, Tom Halley, 
told us firsthand. Uh, he said, I was there every time Heinz quit. I, I saw Al and Abe pacing back and forth. What are we going to do? We got to find Heinz, calling around and around to find him. Heinz would just pack up and leave for Germany, and then they would call and convince him to come back. He was he was just fed up. He, he signed on for two months. Two months is yeah. all his contract was for. Yeah. And uh, unfortunately, he had to he had to work long. It took a lot out of his life. He was ill through most of the film. He nearly died. Well, he's such a perfectionist, yeah. you know, and yeah. you have 20, 30, 40, 100, eventually 200 people working under you, fulfilling your your vision. He would stay late. He would come in earlier, stay later than everybody and uh, creep around the studio at night when nobody was there, going around correcting everybody's drawings. He would correct all <laughs> of their drawings at night when they were while they were having two and three hour drinking times at the, the bar at the, at the pub at the pub he, he was working and he always complained about that look uh, i'm you guys are taking two three hours off in the afternoon to go to the pub and i'm still working and then you i you come back and i'm still working he's working all night he really wanted to get this done as fast as he could and it caused huge problems with his health and his satisfaction because he was totally dissatisfied with working with uh, that this kind of way Mm. This is all so fascinating to learn, and you really, you kind of answered my question because all throughout the book you hear about how the animators didn't have the script to work with, okay. and you're saying that they had to do the scenes for the songs first. So mm. I guess once they got the script and they had dialogue, they worked on that later. Yeah, as soon as they got it, they got it in bits and pieces. They got a snatch of dialogue here and a snatch of dialogue there. The animators will tell you they, they had no idea how this film was going to be put together because they would be working on one sequence at the end of the film and then working on another sequence at the beginning of the film. And nobody ever told them, because they didn't have it, what the whole plot was going to be from beginning to end. They would tell about going to the rushes, you know, when you go to see what's been done so far. And uh, one, one of them, I think it was Jeff Goldner, says how the most exciting part was you'd be watching it along, you know, a finished scene, which would be followed by maybe a black and white scene because they hadn't filled in the color yet. So it would go into a, a line test. And then all of a sudden up on the screen would say scene. Come. And he said that was the best part because your imagination would just go wild with what was coming next. They had no idea what they were doing. Was there any sense of what scenes would follow what? Was, no. was there any sense of flow at all? Not really. Not really. Not until the end when they put it all together. I think Bob Balser, one of the animation directors, told us they put a script together after the film. Was That's done. right. After it was done, they had a script. They finally put, you know, what <laughs> what it ended up being. So they just they did it in so many disjointed pieces. It is amazing that the thing holds together as well as it does. So basically, from the very beginning, all that the the animators and everybody working on the film knew was that this was like a good guys versus bad guys, Beatles versus the Blue Meanies, mm -hmm. and not much more than that. Right. Yeah, that's about it. And <laughs> also that uh, Heinz was on the uh, opposite side from the standpoint that he was a supporter <laughs> of the Blue Meanies. Well, he was such a fan of <laughs> monsters. Right. He's mm. a war submarine. He likes to draw <laughs> monsters. And he has a very dark, witty sense of humor. Uh, very sardonic. And, uh, y you know, because of the stress and all the the, the fighting, infighting with the producers. Um, he, he did say towards the end, he was hoping that the Meanies would win. <laughs> and did you see that, that centerpiece sort of thing, the centerfold that we have in the book, which is a two-page spread of one of his pieces he made for the German magazine Twen, mm -hmm. was his designer, which is called Eat the Beatles. Yeah. <laughs> which if you have to look at it very carefully, but you'll see that this is what he was feeling towards the end of the production. He suggested a couple of alternative endings for the film with this magazine article, and that one was one where the Pepper People, and no, yeah, the, yes, the Pepper People, and ate. The, the, the Pepper People are eating the Meanies and the That's Beatles, right. aren't they? Yeah, they're actually eating them. So you see, um, you know, one of them's pulling an eye out, and somebody else is eating the head off of somebody, and you can even see Ringo's head being carried on a platter. <laughs> one of them it's it's rather disgusting but it's funny at the same time um, he enjoyed the beatles though it's just he just, just did not like uh having to be the put happy end. in that kind of situ yeah. situation yeah okay i've got some questions about the music and then i'll pass you over to darren the reason why i asked about the timeline of this whole thing was because the song altogether now i was wondering if it was written knowing 
that it was going to be used in the film because it's so perfect at the end with the Beatles in person leading into it. And that was recorded in May, May 12th of 1967. So you're saying that it started, the filming started or the work started in May of 67, correct? Or not work. No, I'm thinking the contract was signed around there. That was That's done right. during the Sgt. Pepper recording sessions, wasn't that? That song it's, was supposed to be on Sgt. Pepper and got rejected at the last minute? No. Only a Northern Song was originally supposed to be on Sgt. Pepper, and George oh, Martin thought that George could do better. But all together now, as well as It's All Too Much. Oh, I'm sorry. Were, I was answering All Too Much. You're yeah, that, you got all together yeah. now. Yeah. Yeah. Um, um, which was recorded when? What's the date for All Together Now? Um, All Together Now is May 12th, 1967. Well, it's my understanding that that one was recorded specifically for the movie, All Together Now. Okay. Because It's All Too Much was recorded May 25th and 31st and June 2nd. So well, I, I'm just wondering if in any way we, we could figure out in the Beatles' minds if they were thinking about it being in the movie or not. So, no, I don't think it's all too much. I, I don't think at all. That one was done by George about his LSD experience. Mm -hmm. Right. And all together now, I think, was just done as a throwaway. As I was reading the recording notes of that just recently, um, it was done for the film, but they did it in in like on one day. They did the whole thing in one day. They made it up. Right. They were in the studio and they made the whole thing up in one day. Mm. Um, not with any intention of how it would be depicted in the film. I don't think that was on their minds that was seldom on their minds it was just a, a mm. quick little thing we, we we owe them four songs that that was part of the contract they had to come up with four new songs so they gave them let's dash this one off like they did with head bulldog towards the end mm -hmm. one more song so let's dash this off as long as you mentioned it can you explain to our listeners why hey bulldog was left off of the u.s version um let me start with this and you can take it to okay. another level hey bulldog the quality of the original drawings was below par. Heinz did not like the quality, that quality. So he raised a whole lot of hell on that and said, well, if we need to take anything out, then this is what we're going to take out. And they did. Later on, of course, they, they, they returned to it. But his, his feeling was the, the drawing was not, did not match up with the rest of the quality of the others. And that bothered him a great deal. Other people probably wouldn't have bothered. Mm. But he was a perfectionist. And he said, this, this is not the same. You're, this is not the same bulldog as you're supposed to be drawing. This is not the same this, that, these, and those. And that's, that's why he, he uh, came down quickly on them. It's an interesting mystery because a lot of people have ideas that there are lots of different explanations about why they ended up cutting it. Um, one was that it wasn't received well in test screenings in the United States. So the film was released in July of 68 in the UK, but not until November in the United States. And they called back in a bunch of animators to change the ending. Nobody knew why they were changing the ending or exactly how. Again, they were just given assignments to do. And we tell in this volume how the film was already on release and they're back at the, a different studio. They had to hire out a whole new building and just a few of them came back to fix fix the ending. And they had to go down to the movie studio and look outside at the posters outside the wall to figure out the actual model sheets. They didn't have any of the model sheets anymore. So to make sure they got the characters Very right, sad they ending. went down to, yeah. to see that. So it may have been it took too long to get to the ending. You know, the ending sort of like Lord of the Rings. There's like five different endings. It ends and then there's another ending and then there's another mm. ending. The length of the film is certainly not very long so i don't think it was the length of the film it was just sort of they got that song so late i think it was february of 68 when they finally got hey bulldog mm -hmm. um and um we make a case in that too that that a disgruntled lennon being forced to write something for somebody he disliked some of those lyrics can clearly be interpreted as being about al brodax you know you you think you're something special you think you know me but you haven't got a clue that kind of thing sounds to me like lennon talking to brodax but anyway um, they got the song so late that it was really difficult for them to shoehorn it into the production at that point. But it's such a good song. They really wanted to include it. And uh, George Dunning, the overall director, really liked the piano idea. It was his idea to have it have him fighting with the player piano. And the the bulldog had already been designed. He's in the beginning of the film. 
but of, it's obvious that you know make that scene about a bulldog if the song's about a bulldog so mm. they sent that off to a whole nother unit who animated that um the storyboard is is quite simplistic as bob was saying it, it much more resembles the cartoon of earlier days where it's just a bunch of uh, beetles running around in circles you know slapstick sort of humor so it stands out in a way as different from the rest of the movie but not a whole lot you know they they put it back in and i think all of us beatles fans are happy that they did because more is better whenever it's, it's beatles songs are concerned mm. so Heinz, Heinz is not happy that it was yeah, put back in yeah he, he was, a, as we say, a perfectionist, and that wasn't his work, and it wasn't his design. So I think he was one of the most vocal ones to take it out. Indeed. Yeah. Okay, one last thing about the songs in the movie. How were all the other songs chosen in the film? Were they picked by Al Brodax or certain people? Did they say, well, I think we, it would be great if we had a, a sequence for Eleanor Rigby. It would be great if we had one for Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds. How were those songs chosen? I think they had that in the contract from the beginning. There's a list of songs that they were allowed to use, mostly off of Sgt. Pepper. Sgt. Pepper had just come out, and I remember they had to. Uh, they were invited by George Martin. A couple of the principals were invited to come over before the film had. I'm sorry, before Sgt. Pepper had been released, and they got an early listening of it. So it was always intended that most of the songs would be from that album. But I remember seeing some of the contract notes. They're included in the anthology book that have, uh, uh, like, You Know My Name, I think, was intended for the, the film that never made it in. A couple of songs are on that list that they didn't use in the film. So I think the, the song list was, was agreed upon from the very beginning. Oh, they never finished You Know My Name until 69. Mm. So, <laughs> oh, well, maybe um, there was some thought about right. putting that song in there. Darren, I believe it's your turn. Oh, it's my turn. And uh, I want to... I was wondering if you could give us um, a sampling of these individuals, the behind the scenes folks that, you know, at the beginning of the, this conversation, you refer to them lovingly as the grunt workers. And they're the ones that kind of get, you know, the spotlights put upon them on this new book. Can you cherry pick a couple of those individuals who turned out to be interesting characters in your mind and really added to uh, this second volume I would with, love the, to. with the stories they had to tell? Thank you for that question. Yes. That's a um, question. Yeah. Cam Ford in Australia, an Australian animator, is the one who really inspired us to write volume two because he has an excellent memory. You know, we're talking about 50 years ago where we're interviewing these people. Uh, he also is one of the few who brought a camera with him to the to the studio. So we have a lot of new candid shots of the actual people working on the film, working on the film. And he was already well he was already friends with his future wife diana but in the middle of production invited her over from australia she came over they got engaged in the middle of the production and ended up being married for over 50 years now that's one thing that I, i'd like to point out is uh the, the film has thanks to al brodex talking about it the film has somewhat of a reputation of a lot of sex and drugs going on you know a lot of free love and that kind of thing but what we discovered was there were 10, I think 10 couples have had 50 year marriages as uh, either met on yeah. the set or soon after got married during the production. So it was full of real love. You know, the these people was, were really yeah. in love with each other, with the Beatles, with the time, inspired by the time. So Cam and Diana Ford in Australia, they turned us on to a couple others like uh, Lawrence Moorcroft, a South African self-taught animator who had been working in in uh, Germany when he heard about Yellowstone and came over was hired by Hallis and Bachelor, the only other animator in England at the time, um, the ones who did Animal Farm, it was eventually fired by Hallis. He said the best thing that ever happened to him because then he got picked up by the submarine. Um, Everyone got fired by that. Yeah. <laughs> John Hallis, a lot of people yeah. came over from there. Norm Drew, I mentioned already, from Toronto. It was a real international crew, clearly. Came over in January, just started looking for work um, and got picked up. Tom Halley was a Scottish animator who was a, a family man. He's one of the older ones in this book, but uh, had been a World War II fighter pilot and worked in intelligence and eventually started animating. Uh, worked with Disney for a number of years. A number of the older animators actually were Disney trained. Who else is in the book? Jeff Goldner, Maggie Geddes, who you might remember from the Mod Odyssey, the trailer for the film that a lot of us love. She shows up in that. She's the, the cool looking girl with the red miniskirt on. 
Um, she was actually the head of the trace and paint department at only 21 years old. I don't know how she did that. She must have started working when she was a teenager in Australia. Another Australian come on. Lucy Elvin, we have in this book. Lucy and David, actually, another lifelong love marriage. Uh, David did the backgrounds, so he's the one responsible for the scene inside the Beatles' house where all those cartoon characters show up, like the Phantom and Mandrake the Magician. He was on his own to come up with those characters and put a bunch of characters in and then had to take them out because they weren't King Features characters, which I thought was an interesting coincidence when Bill Morrison talked to us about his graphic novel of the Yellow Submarine by Titan Comics came out in 2018. Finally, um, he put in, he had to take out those King Features <laughs> characters because he didn't have rights to put them in. So it was an interesting twist. So uh, Lucy Elvin was Trace and Paint. And she was in, uh, she told us all about working on the Lucy in the Sky sequence, which, uh, no, that was Diana Ford. Sorry, Diana Ford did the Lucy in the Sky sequence, which was fascinating, I thought, to hear firsthand how uh, a number of the women from Trace and Paint were picked up, not told why, just given this new assignment to start rotoscoping. And that's when you have film that's run through a device and you're sitting on top of a, what she called a bicycle seat perch. A, a, a very uncomfortable, you know, with a hood over top of you, and you're tracing over the film cell one at a time. So she said, we traced off thousands and thousands of, of pictures of horses and carousels and Fred Astaire and all of that that goes into the Lucy in the Sky sequence. And then the fun part came where they got to paint those cells in any way they wanted. They were just told to be as wild as possible, splash paint down, you know, eat a piece of cheese and with your oily fingers, swirl it around. And and she said they had no idea. They thought it's going to look terrible. They thought for certain it was going to look terrible to go all outside the lines like that. But it ended up, obviously, holding up very well. One of the best love sequences in the movie. So let's see. Anybody else? Who, I'm forgetting a lot of them, aren't I? Well, I'm, I'm thinking. Were you, able to, were you able to actually, in the book, then have the individual and pinpoint each person's contribution to what they did, to what when you so that when you watched the scene... Just like what you were just describing now with the Lucy in the Sky with Diamond segment, do you basically have uh, documentation of everyone's contributions, however big or small? Not everyone, but most. As much as we right. could, yes, certainly. That was, right. Yeah, that's why that was the major reason why, again, why we wanted this book done was to let people know who really created this, because mm -hmm. that was what Sir George and others were saying. Look. That, that's the best thing about this. We are going to really know inside and out where all this stuff came from and who gets credit. Because in the past, the very first time, fortunately, a lot of people did not give credit, get credit, that worked on this film, which was a horrific thing. And that's mainly Bro Al Brodax's fault because he played politics. Yeah, I think you'll, you'll want to watch the movie again after you read the book because you'll know when you see the, the cavalry come out in the Sea of Monsters and the, the submarine opens up and they go out and rescue Ringo, you'll know that was done by Cam Ford and you'll know how he did it because it's all detailed. He, he goes into great detail about how that scene was animated. Seven seconds, I think it lasts. Seven seconds. It took him about two weeks to do. The fish doing the breaststroke in the Sea of Time, that was an idea that Tom Halley had. The hoochie coochie hmm. girl, there's a girl in the tie when they all start reanimating towards the end of the film. And it's doing a pan across and somebody has a lady on his tie and all of a sudden she comes to life too and does a little bump. That's that's Norm Drew. He said, I have an idea. Let me add this in. And they said, sure, go ahead. And Simma Balser's diary. We have pages right out of her diary. And she remembers, she's one of a few actually, who remembers coming up with the line, are you bluish? You don't look bluish. <laughs> so that's a wonderful memory to, to see that. A lot of people remembered that line. But, uh, you know, her diary, I think her diary entries are quite fun. Well, you know, it, it's just pretty fascinating because it, this, this, the whole, hearing how this was all done, and then of course you read the read the book and read the first book and get a, you know like a really in depth look at how the movie was put together. It sounds like they were putting together a puzzle without any idea of what the final puzzle was supposed to to be, yeah. what the picture was supposed to be in the puzzle. They just had all these pieces and were you know figuring out how they all fit together. And then, but but the, yet again, that ends up being the charm of the movie. It all, like this madness came together and created the, um, you know, one of the reasons why the movie is so loved and uh, is timeless. Mm -hmm. Is it's all these vivid, all these different ideas and 
folks with vivid imaginations and throwing things styles. against the wall and everything sticking nicely, as it turned out. Yeah, different styles of animation. That is one of its right. it, its successes. It goes through all these different styles. You've got the montage. You've got the mixed media effect. of That's Charlie Jenkins. Like, for example, the Eleanor Rigby, when you've got real photographs that right. were animated. Um, you see that in a couple. That, that's influenced Monty Python, as, as Terry Gilliam will tell you. But there's no other film like Yellow Submarine. There's never been a sequel. There's never been a film that looks like it. And a lot of that is because of the deadline pressure and the chaos. As Tom Halley said, it comes down to the complexity of chaos. And the choices that you make out of that complexity goes a long way to achieving the result. And some would call that visual development. But it's just making the right choices. And if you have the right kind of team which they had, uh, it's just amazing that it, it worked. That's what George Dunning was saying. But at the same time, that's an argument for it's it's sort of, it's meant to be, you know? It, it's a, it's the final result of the film. It could either be a disaster or an absolute gem, which it ended up being. Right. It's it's also amazing that these, these brilliant artists that made such critical contributions to the film weren't credited. That's and that if somebody doesn't pick up this new book, Mm-hmm. They that's remain. Great. What's the word I'm for? Anonymous. That's mm-hmm. that's not the right word. They they remain. They remain like uh, you know, their work remains un, uncredited and unknown. But it was so vivid and beautiful and um, critical to the success of the film. Yet they didn't receive any uh, any credit. Mm-hmm. In part, the truth is, in part, and you're not going to like this. It was it's the Beatles' fault, and to mm-hmm. some degree here. There was all kinds of crazy things going on uh, behind the scenes, uh, which slowed slowed these guys down. And a lot of the things that they were hoping to do, they were eliminated from doing it from from uh, Mr. Brodax. There was a, as you know, there was a huge battle going on, in which we almost lost the film altogether. And if you read the first book, then you know that we were actually. Oh, we're, certain parts of it were going to be stolen uh, to keep and prevent from inferior quality work going out. That's how far the people that cared about this film were determined to turn out a good product rather than a cheap one. Uh, and unfortunately, when you have your boss is a Brodax, and if you've ever read his book on the Yellow Submarine, you understand why he was so disliked by the people that work for him. That it, it, it was very, very, uh, it was a mean type of thing. The, the kidnapping of the film, I think you're talking about, we talk about that mostly in volume one, but uh, we do get the reactions of the people who were on the ground and what they observed. And basically the producers, Al Brodax, uh, they'd, they'd run out of money and they were almost out of time. And his solution was stop, just stop, <laughs> just stop now. And, and the uh, creative teams, but but it's not finished. We can't just cut it off like a piece of cheese. Um, so he said, well, here's how you do it. Then I'll just farm it out to another studio. He thought for sure he could just take it out and, and send it to somebody else to finish. But um, Australia. Yeah. And so uh, when they heard that that was a possibility, the producer, John Coates, and the director, George Dunning, snuck in overnight and carted away about two thirds of the film, the original artwork and the, the corresponding cells and hid them as a leverage in their negotiation. So they they got the union in and everybody signed up to join the union and say, nope, you can't do it. You can't take, you can't finish the film now without this material. So there was a tense two or three weeks there where they were afraid they were going to lose their studio because TVC had run out of money. And uh, the people remember being paid by King Features for that short period of time. And they weren't quite sure why they had to line up in the hallway to get their checks from Abe Goodman all of a sudden. And they would look out the window to see if somebody was coming across with the money, whether or not they were going to be paid that week. So they they put their foot down. They ended up investing 25,000 of their own pounds to finish. It t- almost bankrupted it TV did, cartoons. It did bankrupt them. For 10 years, they had to yeah. work on commercials just to stay solvent. Um, and none yeah. of the animators made much money. You know, They made just their wages on this film. They didn't make any money off of the merchandising. They didn't get anything from residuals afterwards. So, um, yeah, and the, you, you look at the DVD and the people who worked on the renovations and you've got this long string of credits of everybody who worked on the digital version of it. 
every single person and their brother, but um, still the original animators, only a handful of them got listed in the original credits. Wow. Well, well, that was politics. The Broad Act really uh, pulled out the last bit of nastiness he could. And uh, it, it really was difficult to see TBC almost go down in flames just by creating this film. But fortunately, even though it took them like 10 years to, to, to pay up those solvent. debts mm -hmm. and to become solvent again, they returned. Thank heavens they did. Yeah, they produced an Academy Award winning film. The, That's correct. The Snowman and did a number of Raymond Briggs novels and Wind in the Willows and all kinds of wonderful children's films that they won many awards for in the 90s. And The Snowman is a favorite in in my household yeah, every, every year. Christmas, yep. Christmas we watch it. Yep. <laughs> made um, by the uh, same people who made Yellow Submarine. <laughs> I want to ask Dr. Bob about this, some uh, some about the symbolism in the film. If you could give us a couple of interesting examples of things that maybe passed our eyes dozens and dozens of times as we've watched the movie through the years uh, that you can kind of give us a, a little bit of your insight uh, about. Well, the meaning of um, from the very beginning of, of yellow and submarine is, a, is a, a good, good insight into that because of yellow and its meaning of intelligence and the divine wisdom and that everything is really is based upon the mind. That's why you live in the mind and steer clear of those things which are emotional, which means that you have to move to higher states of consciousness. And I think in, within the Beatles' work, that's part of what they do in their own music. Uh, so, But there's no way in the world I could uh, put that into the, the mouths of the people that created the film, except that this crew, I think, is uh, just one of the great examples of, regardless of about whether everything can go wrong, and it did, that you can always save a situation if you work hard enough and if your consciousness is there and do not get tied up in your emotions, but to try to maintain a clear vision within your mind. Those are the things that I think were key. The Beatles situation of rebirth at, that Laura mentioned earlier was very important because I do believe that, as uh, we touched on, that there was some kind of connection there with ancient Egypt that the Beatles, at least one of them, might have known about. Because when you take a yellow submarine and, and, and in, the, in the movie you, you have also, or in ancient Egypt, you have a long banana-like strength boat along with the sun controlling it. You have the same kind of story, and that story, of course, is dealing with higher consciousness or divine wisdom or the basically steering clear of the emotions, which I think is still one of the biggest problems we have on our planet today. Hmm. All right. Thank we you also, very much. I'm sorry. We, I was just going to add there that we also compare well, Pepper, Pepperland to Atlantis. Oh, yes. Oh, and yes. Right, right. That was something yeah. I thought was fascinating. Yeah, yeah. Tell, tell us more about that. That, that can you... Well, just the idea that it's uh, 80,000 leagues under the sea, sea. and uh, it's, um, it's a utopia of sorts. Uh, well, even when the meanies attack, it's still, you know, More the same around. story of Atlantis. There's some kind of destruction and the survivors flee and they flee in their ark or their boat and they go somewhere for help. And uh, they bring back help in the form of the Beatles in this case. <laughs> um, but, uh, yeah, what else do we talk about symbolically? I was looking for that note. Oh. Here it is. The, the The ultimate yellow submarine message is basically that we all live in a yellow submarine and our friends are all aboard. It basically means that we're one people on one planet. And as Bob was saying, the yellow means mind and submarine means emotion. So we're talking about mind over emotion, staying out of the seas of illusion. And then you can travel the universe in your mind because it's all in the mind and nothing is real. And you hear them say, turn off your mind and relax and float downstream. So it's, it's that love and harmony. These are your so-called weapons that we use to transform. Now, that's important, too. Not, yeah, not important. defeat your that's enemy. Right. You're transforming yeah. them. You know, come on over. Join us, won't you? You don't um, have to kill or murder. Right. 
by elevating the awareness or consciousness of your enemy, there's no need to kill. If you, and that's exactly what happens within the film, which was the thing that excited me the most about the entire piece, which is that you don't have to go to war to change things. You can work things out over long periods of time, of course. But then, of course, the final message is that there are newer and bluer meanies all around us all the time. So we always have to go out singing. So I love those little aphorisms of goodness that just come right out of the film and the, the catchphrases and all together now. I love that final sequence where they just show up in all the different languages of the world. All together now, all together now. That's a that's a wonderful Especially, song. Yes, they, in the uh, closing of the film. Very simple, but also very deep. You know, you're talking about chopping wood, carrying water. It's a, a Zen Buddhist koan, and you're talking about red, white, pink, blue, yellow. I don't care what color you are. You know, you can you could be my friend and come have tea with me. So it's it's a simple child song, but just like everything that the Beatles do, there's three and four different ways you can interpret it. And uh, I just love the way that they end the movie with that in multiple languages. Well, when I first saw this film, I thought I was looking at several different levels of meaning. In other words, three to four different things going on. And then this new book that hopefully will come out in the years to come where we're helping this guy try to do that. Basically said every verse can be interpreted on at least three different levels. An innocent child's singing law, sing along, a ribald or drug reference, and a philosophical metaphysical leaning. One, two, three, four, can I have a little more, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, I, I think everything that the Beatles wrote might have a hidden meaning that may be even hidden from them. But I'd love to know if whether or not they are conscious of some of these things. Hmm. Interesting. And that last scene, at what point in the development of the film uh, was it decided that the Beatles would actually make an appearance, the one that they filmed and tacked on to the end? When did that become uh, reality? I think that was also well, agreed upon from the beginning. They uh, had to. They were they were considering using them to do the voices. They really thought that they might be able to do that, but they were just too busy. So they well, they wanted this film to be counted amongst the fourth the film that they needed, third. or third, excuse me, the third one. So, mm -hmm. so the, the so they were the, supposed to come in. You know, interestingly, with that end sequence in that part where they're live, as well as the song before it, it's all too much. That was. Um, if you watch them carefully, you can see that's what the animators cringe because that's when they ran out of money. So it's all too much. As as much as people love it, it's uh, it's really taped together. I mean, literally, those um, that's that's Scotch tape or cello tape, as they call it in England. Cello. In the background, that they found a way to shoot through a polarized filter so that it, it's got that prismatic effect. And if you look carefully, the groups of Pepper people are all moving in unison because they had run out of time to individually animate each of these things. It takes a long time. So they took a lot of shortcuts at the end. And yet you'll find a lot of the reviewers point to that sequence as their favorite. It shows so much the psychedelic experience that, you know, it really makes me feel like I'm on tripping or whatever. Sure. Uh, and yet it was done on a real shoestring budget. They had to come up with all kinds of ways to cut corn. And the reason the Beatles are wearing all black and they're filmed against the black background was because the whole idea for the end was to be another a reverse of the Eleanor Rigby approach where they were going to have live action mixed with animation. So they were going to have animated characters floating all over them. That's what that's why they're wearing black. And that's the other thing they didn't have time to do in the end. It would have been very cool, I'm sure, if they could have had animation. You, you see it in Paul's hand. He lifts up his hand and there's that little animated love. I think that's about the only thing they ended up getting in there. But um, if you can imagine, I think, I don't know, this is my own idea. I think they had that extravaganza planned perhaps with the Beatles combined. I'm not sure what they, what they were thinking. When did they film that? In, in January? That part that they put on the end? I can't recall right now, no. I'm asking the Beatles Bible, Bible people over there. But <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. It, I don't, it, I don't it was earlier than that. I thought, but I think, I guess by that time they had an idea that of what the the script was well at least the plot line we'll put it that way the storyboard was was going to be so they could tack it on at the end but i think they ended up at the end they were hoping they were going to make that a little more special yeah run out of time run out of money 
you know, one date I do know, and this is a off the topic, but one date I do know, I just posted this up to our Yellow Submarine Facebook page that would interest the Beatles fans, that on September 25th, 1967, two of the Yellow Submarine staff were over at Abbey Road. That was the day that they were recording Fool on the Hill. And it's also the day that uh, they had those journalists there from Tokyo Life that were interviewing them. And I think that's the first day that anybody saw a picture of John together with Yoko. That's why that session of photo session is popular. But it's also a day when you can see John Coates and director Jack Stokes. Stokes, they're the two wearing the suits. They're there visiting Abbey Road to show them the four Beatles, their likenesses, their Edelman portraits of how they would appear in the movie. And that they had just recently been approved by King Features. So that may have been the first day that they were seeing their, their likenesses as they would be portrayed in the film. And clearly a lot groovier than they looked in the TV cartoon. So I, <laughs> judging by their faces and their expressions, I think they were pretty pleased with them from the beginning. Anyway, that's right. a cute little post we just put up on our Yellow Submarine Facebook page. Oh, very cool. And that, uh, oh, and the Yellow Submarine Facebook page, and then, of course, probably should elaborate more then. The website is uh, yellowsubmarinebook.com. Let's talk about the fact that there are two volumes of this new book that you can purchase. Yes, we have a limited edition of what's left of the volume ones, and we have an even more limited edition of our back covers that we've made into a collector's package. So um, that's what's for sale at yellowsubmarinebook.com. And currently, we are the exclusive distributors. This is a self-published book. Um, I believe the Fest for Beatles fans still has a few copies that they're selling, but um, you'll get uh, personalized autographed copies from us along with some bonus prizes. As a matter of fact, if you're interested, we could or we could offer a bonus to everybody who tells us they heard about it from your show. Oh, that would be great. Okay. We have yeah. something, we picked out something that we have uh, from Dr. Bob's ultimate collection of yellow submarine things. We have some... United States Postal Service Yellow Submarine postage stamps that came out a number of years ago. So they're, I think they're 32 cent stamps. Anyway, they're on these first day issue commemorative postmarked envelopes of the day that the stamps were issued. Um, and we will give those out till supplies run out because I know this is a podcast and it's going to be up there eternally. So if you write to us five years from now and ask for one, we may not. <laughs> but un- until supplies run out, everybody who orders it, who mentions your podcast, we'll make sure we include one of those with your purchase. Very nice. Thank you. Uh, can, yeah. I, can I just ask one more question? And it's just a quick one. Okay. I just want to ask you one thing. And to some people, this might be so obvious, but I've been told that, you know, throughout the Yellow Submarine film, there are various times when the Beatles hold up three fingers. They hold up their thumb, their index finger, and their pinky. And that's supposed to be the sign language for I love you. Is there any truth to this? I would think so. Uh, yeah, I, I think, think there so. is. And you'll see on conspiracy sites, it's also the sign of the devil. So uh, oh, I, don't know if, I don't know if you've fallen down that <laughs> rabbit hole or not. But yeah, that, there's um, some people out there who don't, uh, you know, will say that that's why the Beatles are, are evil. <laughs> Whatever they want to conclude. It's also a common sign that you'll see a lot of rock and rollers do, you know, yeah, sticking their tongue out when they're playing their guitar and they put their fingers up like that. It's just, it's, it's a, It does say I love you in sign language, but I remember we asked Heinz Edelman this, Bob. You may not remember because of the conspiracy question. That was what I was following up on with him. And I think he said it was just an interesting, unusual way to hold your fingers. But they did use it. It's on the promo poster and everything. So I like to say it's because it means I love you. I think that makes the most sense. Okay. Should should we draw any hints in here that there are subliminal messages in this show? And if some folks <laughs> yes, there are. Listen to it backwards. Yeah, quite a few. Are there Thanks. any Paul is dead clues in the movie that we don't know about? <laughs> yeah, there's six. Play it backwards, and we'll find out. <laughs> I'm looking at, at just, and then we can uh, get back to the you know, the uh, the conclusion. I'm looking on your Facebook page. It's three of the Beatles, and Paul's playing. What is that? A recorder. Yeah. And. Who are the two men in the suits in the The two men in the suits. The one with the white beard, that's Jack Stokes. He's the co-animation director, and he's the the other co-animation director did all the travel sequences, and everything else was was Jack. And he's the one that did the Hey Bulldog sequence, too. Uh, John Coates is the other one. He's what would have been called a line producer, but he got demoted by Al Brodax when it came to credits, so he's called a production coordinator, I think, on the screen. But he's really the the day-to-day 
person who produced the film. Everybody looked up to John as Papa John. John Coates, he was the uh, one of the founders of TVC. So he was the, the businessman who, who got the film made. Right. Okay. All right. All right, Alan. Okay, so that uh, went by awfully quickly. We didn't have even time to do a second round, but um, a ton of fascinating information, much, much, much more in the two books. If you're a Yellow Submarine fan, these two books are must-haves. And uh, you know anything you want to know about Yellow Submarine, how it was made, stuff you never even thought about is in these two books. The first one, Inside the Yellow Submarine, the making of the Beatles animated classic. And the new one, It's All in the Mind, Inside the Beatles Yellow Submarine, Volume 2, by... Dr. Bob Hieronymus and Laura Cortner. So thanks so much for joining us and, uh, and, and bringing all this info, Bob and Laura. Thank and you for having us. Really look forward yeah, to our pleasure. really insightful. Thank you. Great question. Mon pleasure. And uh, so we'll go around and give our contact information. Uh, why don't we start with the two of you? Uh, if people want to get in touch with you, you mentioned a Facebook page and a website. Why don't you just give that information again? Um, yeah, it couldn't be simpler. Yellowsubmarinebook.com. And it's the same on Facebook slash Yellow Submarine Book. So Yellowsubmarinebook.com, you can get both volumes plus a special hardback edition and special bonus prizes that you would be surprised how many bonus prizes we have on the Facebook page. We try to put up a, a new one each week. Okay. Um, and Ken, you want to give your information? Yeah, very quickly. My email address is everylittlething at att.net. My website is kenmichaelsradio.com. Be sure to visit there every single week for Beatles Trivia, where you can win one of ten prizes each week. I have a YouTube channel, Ken Michaels Radio. And then there's my Talk More Talk, a solo Beatles video cast podcast. Uh, the next one will be next Monday, which is March the 22nd at 9 p.m. Eastern on our Facebook page. We'll be reviewing the brand new Ringo Starr EP. Zoom in. So there you go. Okay, and Darren? Uh, you can write me, if you want to send me an email, email me at WFUV. And the email address, actually, I've been saying now for, gee, I don't know, decades now, I think, Darren DeVivo at, I think I just recently found out that it's probably a lot easier just to go D DeVivo at WFUV.org. So, uh, let's go with that. My email address, ddevivo at wfuv.org. If you want to email me, I have two Facebook pages. You can um, send me a friend request at my main page, Darren DeVivo, or, and, or, like my other page, which is, has the cumbersome name, Darren DeVivo, WFUV DJ, Beatles podcaster, writer, and you can catch me on WFUV uh, at 90.7 FM, 90.7 FM HD2 in the New York City area, and we stream at WFUV.org and have an app. You can listen on our app, download that, and you could uh, hear me Monday through Thursday nights, 10 p.m. till midnight and Saturday afternoons from 1 to 4 p.m. You can reach me on Facebook at either Alan Cozen or Alan Cozen Remixed. You can write to all three of us at Things We Said Today, radio show at gmail.com. We have a Twitter feed, which is at Things We Said Fab, and two, count them two, Facebook pages, Things We Said Today, Beatles Radio Fans, which is our main one, and also just plain old Things We Said Today. The shows get posted on those and on Podbean and on YouTube and on iTunes. Um, please subscribe to us on one or more of them. And... Uh, yeah, that's about it. So thank you again to Dr. Bob Hieronymus and Laura Kortner. Uh, and we will see you next time.